I got to know Vincent very well, but uh, <coughs> it all started when I was still film critic of the Times, and um, he was in town uh, making, I forget which of the um, Edgar Allan Poe things, and so I, I thought it'd be interesting to interview him for the Times. And I went along to uh, to his hotel uh, one day, obviously, when he wasn't shooting. <clears throat> and um, arrived before him, as I, so I was sitting in his rooms with uh, the PR lady for the uh, the movie. And he, he arrived a little flustered, late, and very apologetic, with under his arm the most wonderful drawing uh, of A Bird's Wing by George Richmond, which apparently he had just bought in the Fine Art Society round the corner, and so on. And so, uh, of course, I immediately knew what it was, and uh, uh, asking him about it, and so the, then there were, we were off, because what I hadn't realised was that in the 30s, he had been uh, a student at the Courtauld Institute. That he was a trained art historian, uh, like me, but long before me, naturally. And uh, then he had, he uh, took up acting while still in London because he appeared as Prince Albert in the first production of Lord's Houseman's plays about Queen Victoria, which was at a, um, the Q Theatre, which was a club theatre of the time, because then uh, plays about, well, certainly any close royal royalty were not permitted by the Lord Chamberlain, so it could only be produced in a club circumstances. So anyway, he played, the, it was not quite amateur, but... Uh, going that way and uh, the production was so successful that when the plays were being produced the following year in New York with Helen Hayes playing the Queen Victoria he was asked to cast and that was the beginning of his career as a professional actor so the art historian bit went rather by the board but he was always a passionate collector uh, fascinated by it all. And at this time, in the 60s, I think he he had a job uh, running a group of uh, galleries that the chain of stores, Sears Roebuck, had. Uh, I think it was his idea that they should set it up uh, across America and, uh, and write, writing art in their journal and so on. So he, he was very much interested uh, when he wasn't acting, or even when he was, in, in, in art. So that, that we had in common. And I think the, the publicity lady got a bit worried because we were t talking endlessly about that instead of about the movie. But th so that's how I first got to know him. And then you know, we got very friendly and uh, sort of whenever he was in town, I would at least once uh, visit him on set and see some shooting on the film he was doing. Do you remember uh, what film that was? Uh, one of them, a number of them, in fact. I think you know the the, the fur. They they were uh, the Edgar Allan Poe series, so the Fall of the House of Usher and. Uh, and he he wasn't in the pit and the pendulum. I think mm. that was Ray Milan, but he was in all the others. And <coughs> and but but also we do we often have dinner together and uh, and just just meet for chats and so on. And so maybe we used to go to exhibitions together sometimes. So he always enjoyed being taken along with me to. Uh, press views, because uh, even then, when I was pri primarily a film critic, I, I knew a lot of the, uh, the galleries and so on, inevitably, and would get invited to the 
uh, the private views and would take him along yeah. uh, quite often. He he was interested in, in Victorian art. I do remember that. And uh, he liked, I think he had a few old masters uh, as well, but I, th I think his own collection was mostly 20th century, international. Mm. Uh, whether he was at all interested in neo-romantics, I don't know. But still, I think he probably would be. He, he, he certainly enjoyed anything that was good of its kind. Mm. So, uh, but, you know, he was uh, uh, really uh, very funny. I, I, in this connection, I, I must tell you a story from quite late on. I can tell you where, even what film this was. It was uh, called... It was called something different in Britain and in America, but in one of them it was called The City Beneath the Sea, and it was allegedly based on a poem by Edgar Allan Poe. Not that it had anything whatever to do with that. Anyway, and uh, he was in that, and so was Tab Hunter. Now, Tab Hunter you wouldn't think of as a great intellectual, and I'm sure he wasn't, isn't. He's still around. Uh, but... Um, one day I went down to see some shooting on the film and we had lunch. And during lunch, uh, we were talking about art again, and uh, Vincent was started describing this uh, painting by Sheila that he'd seen somewhere, he said. And he was describing it. It was a sort of semi-nude of a young girl lying on a bed with her skirt pulled up to show that she wasn't wearing any knickers and, and uh, the, the, her dress was a beautiful blue at the, and the tab started to twitch and then he said oh Christ why do I always let you do this to me and explain but Vincent was a terrible tease and once he had told him the story of his, Tab's, Sheila. And now, uh, sometime in the 50s, uh, Tab was in New York, went into a gallery and saw this painting that he absolutely loved, he felt he had to have it. It was an egg on Sheila. And it wasn't too expensive because then no one had heard, I mean, Sheila, who's he? Uh, and so on, so he bought it, took it back to L.A., and first of all he had it in his living room, and uh, uh, people, uh, friends coming in and say, hey, you know, that's pretty sick, you know, what do you do, do you jack off to it? And so on, so he found it a bit embarrassing. So he put it in his bedroom, then his mother didn't like it, so it ended up in his own private bathroom adjacent to his bedroom. And uh, even there, there would be people, uh, anybody who happened to be using this bathroom would make sort of ribald comments on it. So, though he loved it, he found it a bit embarrassing. And then uh, one day, a dealer came in to sell, uh, sell him something else and uh, happened to use the bathroom and um, I said, you know, oh, that's interesting. What do you want for it? And Tap said, well, I don't really want to sell it. Uh, and uh, <coughs> he said, oh, come on, you know, and offered him, I think, you know, four times what he'd paid for it. And he thought, well, it is embarrassing, so... All right, so he sold it. Three months later, the Great Sheila Exhibition opened in Vienna. He was instantly recognised as one of the great artists of the 20th century. And so Tab was then thinking, oh, fuck, I mean, if I... Um, act I actually to hang on to it, then... If anybody said anything about it, I could say, but he's one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, 
and it's worth at least a million, and that would silence yeah, all absolutely. the question. So, and anyway, he told Vincent this sad story, and of course Vincent then thereafter kept writing by different routes and describing this, which was obviously a major concern, getting tab all twitchy. But so um, the, that was where, where for once, yeah. the three of us had something artistic in common. Yeah. Uh, and so on. But, uh, but didn't you, you visited the set when he was doing the film Witchfinder General? I, I, I did indeed, quite, quite often, because I knew uh, Michael Reeve uh, uh, just in the, in the general line of, um, you know, uh, film, film star, film director, they tend to come together, especially at festivals, I remember one Cannes festival in particular, I saw quite a lot of him for some reason. Nice guy, nice guy, a bit neurotic I think, very straight. And uh, anyway, I um, so when Vincent was making The Witchfinder General, with, uh, directed by Michael Reeve, I was there quite a lot. And something that's annoyed me recently, uh, I mean, people told me that Vincent was was gay, and quite possibly he was, but I mean, he was also married and uh, didn't come over in any way as gay. And though he knew I was and met my first two partners, uh, he never indicated in any way. I mean, even when once he came to... Uh, to visit me at, at that time, this was the early 60s, I was living in Campton Hill Towers, the first high-rise around Notting Hill, and uh, he came late on uh, after after the theatre, I think, or something, and the, my porter said he nearly had a heart attack when out of the dark loomed this figure. And the unmistakable voice saying, I wonder, is, can you find out if Mr. Taylor is there? <laughs> but, uh, so, I saw quite a lot of him. But, uh, anyway, I was, so I was very annoyed because there's a, a newish book about Michael Reeve come out in the um, series of books about British filmmakers published by the Manchester University Press. And in that, the portrait of Vincent is so, well, A, it's hostile, and, but B, it's totally wide of the mark as far as I can see, because the author of the book appears to be extremely homophobic and uh, depicts Vincent as a sort of screaming queen who's putting the make on everyone in sight and a camping round and giving Michael Reeve a very hard time. Did you ever to, get that impression? No, I, I mean, absolutely not. I mean, one thing, as an actor, Vincent was extremely professional. I think the great thing about him was that he, being extremely bright, he knew exactly what each role that he was doing was worth, whether it was you know, rubbish movie, yes, the uh, actor has to make a living, or it was something more serious, and would gauge his approach to the film, the filmmaking uh, thing, and, um, you know, the way he acted, to very accurately to that, but always, always extremely professional. So, that I'm sure that this is uh, something that he never did, never behaved uh, like that, and certainly not on Witchfinder General, from, uh, from what I saw. And he and Michael Reed got on very well, they understood each other as fellow professionals, and that's why I think uh, Witchfinder General is one of his best films, one of the best of the Hammer-type horror films. But... Um, so I was extremely irritated uh, by that. 
and uh, then when I um, uh, when I went to LA, I lost contact with Vincent for for a while. But this then, what years in the I, I went to LA. I started teaching in seventy two, oh. and was uh, were there till seventy eight, and um, so uh, I renewed contact with him, and. In a funny sort of way, I think why we'd lost contact was partly because I'd known his, his first wife quite well as well. And uh, in the interim, uh, he, they got divorced and he'd married Coral Brown, whom also I knew slightly in advance. Very funny lady, that. Tough. And, uh, you know, he... Ex- could be extremely bitchy, uh, but so they suited each other perfectly. But I think he was a bit worried that I know that I might have some sympathies for his first, first wife and so on. But of course, once we met again in LA and uh, for him with Coral, and uh, it turned out that I knew them both and liked them both and, and so on, then. The um, the friendship was again renewed, or in fact it uh, became a sort of triple friendship because I uh, I got on as well with Coral as I did with Vince, and they suited each other so well. So did so you it, kind of bump into each other at a formal occasion? No, it's. Uh, or did he well, contact you? No, I tried to think. I again, yes, it, uh, I I first met him again. L.A. at a uh, at a film opening, I think, uh, where he was there and I was there, and we said, "Hi, fancy seeing you," that kind of thing, and took it up uh, really almost exactly where we'd left off. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, he was still, we still both shared this great interest in in painting, painting. and the visual arts. So on. Not that the film isn't a visual art, of course, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, no, he he was just a lovely guy. I I really liked him a lot, and um, don't like him being mm-hmm. blackguarded in here uh, after his death. In the same way that I don't like Hitchcock being blackguarded after his death. Yes, I feel that I'm perhaps one of the few witnesses who's fully capable of judging these stories Mm -hmm. and hopefully giving them the lie. Not that anyone cares what I think. I do. Well, I find that touching. Mm